Welcome to Bible Breath, where we dig into the Word of God to catch our breath for whatever is coming next. Last time we ended by talking about three things related to baptism, three things we know about baptism. Number one, that baptism was started by Jesus. He's the one who commanded his church to go and baptize in the way that we baptize today. Number two, baptism connects God's word with something visible, uh, something tangible, something you can, you can touch and sense. So water connected with God's word. And number three, it offers some wonderful blessings, forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation. I told you last time to tuck those away in your mind because we would come back to them next time. Well, it's next time. And we're coming back to them. And the reason we're coming back to them is because there is something else in the Bible that has those three characteristics. And you might know what that is. A few weeks before Jesus' command of baptism, he gave his disciples a different type of command. We need to set the context. The disciples were celebrating the Passover with Jesus. It was the Thursday before Jesus would die. So the day before Jesus would die and Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover. And the Passover was a very significant event that went all the way back to the Old Testament. It was an annual celebration. It commemorated the release of the Israelites from over 400 years of slavery under, under the Egyptians. This goes back to the time of Moses in the Old Testament. You might remember that God called Moses from a burning bush and said, Moses, you're going to be the one who's going to go into Egypt and you are going to set my people free because they've been in slavery for far too long. And so Moses went in and Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt would not let the Israelites go. And so God gave Moses the ability to perform all sorts of miracles or plagues that were carried out on them. There was um, massive frogs and, and gnats and uh, lots of things afflicted the Egyptians and the Israelites sometimes and, and made life very, very difficult, uh, all as a way for Pharaoh to compel Pharaoh to say, okay, I've had enough. Your God is great. I will let you go. But he didn't. Plague after plague after plague after plague, Pharaoh kept saying, nope. I'm not going to let them go. They're going to stay here. Moses, you can do whatever you want. Your God can do whatever he wants. And I will not let your people go. Well, then it came to the last plague, a plague that is known as the plague of the firstborn. God told Moses to tell Pharaoh and all the Israelites and all the Egyptians that the Lord is going to come into the camp. The Lord is going to come into Egypt. And every firstborn son in every household is going to be killed. With one exception. The exception, the one exception, this would not happen in any house where the family took a lamb, their most valuable lamb, killed it, shed its blood, and took its blood and painted it over the door frames of the house. Then when the Lord would come into the camp or into Egypt, he would see the door frames uh, covered with blood. He would pass over those houses and spare every person inside, including the oldest son. But every home that did not have the blood of the lamb painted on the door frames, the oldest son of that household would die. And so God provided a way for them to protect themselves, to be saved. And the Israelites, they did this. They took their lambs, they spilled the blood, and they, uh, they painted the door frames with them. Maybe many of the Egyptians did too. Pharaoh did not. There were some other, uh, some other things that God commanded in regard to this. He, uh, he wanted them to eat a certain type of meal. He wanted them to eat unleavened bread and, and they would have uh, wine to drink, which was uh, very customary with their meals back then. So they were eating unleavened bread and they were drinking wine. And then the Lord also said, and eat with your sandals on and with your cloak tucked in as if you're ready to go because tonight is going to be the night that the Lord is going to deliver you from the hand of the Egyptians. And sure enough, that night, the Lord came into the camp, saw all the door frames that were covered with blood in the, Isra in the Israelite camp, passed over them, that's how it got the name of the Passover, passed over those homes, spared everybody inside. But wherever there was not blood painted on the door frame, it went inside. And the oldest son died, including Pharaoh's son. And that was enough for Pharaoh to finally say, I want nothing more to do with these Israelites or with their God. And he told Moses to take the Israelites and go. And they did. And they were set free. And every year after that, they celebrated the Passover by sitting down and eating unleavened bread 
and having wine to drink. They did that every year, all the way up until Jesus and his disciples were doing it on this particular night. So they were sitting down for the Passover and they were having their unleavened bread and they had their wine there to drink and they were together celebrating like they had done previously when the book of Matthew tells us this happened. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you're familiar with the operations of a church, of Christian churches, then you might know that this is the Lord's Supper, um, otherwise known as the Eucharist or the Sacrament of Holy Communion. It's referred to as, as all of those things. But this was the very first time that this had happened. Jesus was instituting, he was starting something new. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Holy Communion, what it is and what it does. Back to the night that Jesus was with his disciples, celebrating the Passover, and when suddenly Jesus did something entirely new that they had never seen before, taking the bread, taking the wine, and saying some very different things about it. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think about this for a moment. What did the disciples receive that night? And when I, what I mean by that is what, what elements did they receive? Did, what elements did Jesus hand to them? as he was giving them the Lord's Supper for the first time. If you look at what different Christian churches teach about Holy Communion, there are three main possibilities, three main different things, three, three options that Christian churches uh, might, might give you as to what it is that the disciples received that night. Some will look at that text and say, well, there seem to be four things. There seems to be, there was bread and there was wine, but Jesus also said, well, this, this bread is my body, and which is not the same thing as bread, it's something different, and the wine is my blood. So there seem to be four things, and some churches will teach that the disciples received four elements that night. Bread, wine, Jesus' body, and Jesus' blood. Those four things were all really present, and that's what Jesus gave them, four things. Others teach, well, you know, Jesus seemed to emphasize in a very special way, it's like, it's like the body and the blood. So this is my body, this is my blood. And so it seems, some churches will say, that, that the bread changed into his body and the bread, or in the wine, changed into his blood. And so really, they'll say, you only receive two things. You receive Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. That, uh, that teaching is called transubstantiation. The first one I gave you is called real presence. And there's a third one known as representation. Representation teaches that the disciples would have received really just two things there, the two that make the most sense, the bread and the wine that they were already having during the meal. And when Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, he didn't actually mean this is my body that I'm giving you or this is my blood that I'm giving you. He meant this bread and this wine, they're supposed to represent them. They're supposed to make you think of those things. So those are the three main ways that you hear Christian churches talk about what the disciples received that night. Real presence, transubstantiation, and representation. They're significant and well-known enough that I, I want to use these as Bible buzzwords just to define them very, very clearly. So real presence is the teaching that Jesus' real body and blood are present with the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper. Or another way to say it is you receive four things when you receive the Lord's Supper. Bread, wine, body, blood. Transubstantiation is the teaching that the bread and the wine change into the body and blood in the Lord's Supper. So it's no longer bread and wine. It's Jesus' real body and Jesus' real blood, but just two things, not four. Representation is the teaching that the bread and the wine only represent Jesus' body and blood in the Lord's Supper. When you go to receive the Lord's Supper, you receive bread and wine. That's what it looks like. That's what it tastes like. But you don't actually receive Jesus' real body and Jesus' real blood. The question becomes then, though, which one does the Bible teach? Remember what faith is. Faith is taking Jesus at his word, whatever his word happens to be. And there's a very particular word that Jesus used as he was giving his disciples the Lord's Supper for the first time. It's a very small word in English, but it's a very important word. It's the word is. He was holding the bread he said, this bread is my body. He was holding the cup. He said, this cup, 
this cup of wine is my blood. He didn't say, this bread is supposed to make you think about my body. He very clearly used the specific word, is. He said, this bread is my body. This cup is my blood. And he didn't say that, well, the body that I'm giving you, it stopped being bread. And the blood that I'm giving you, it, it stopped being wine. If you take Jesus' words just at its most simple, most simple basic way, the real presence that he was giving his disciples bread, wine, and his body, and his blood. And Jesus isn't the only one in Scripture who believes that. It emphasizes that elsewhere in Scripture. If you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, we have uh, a lot of verses that talk about the significance of the Lord's Supper, of Holy Communion, where the Apostle Paul writes in chapter 10, he says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And you may have noted that he's, he's listing the different participants in the Lord's Supper. There's the cup of thanksgiving or the cup of wine. There's the blood of Christ, there's the bread that we break, and then there's the body of Christ. Those are the four different participants that the Apostle Paul mentions. And remember, the Apostle Paul was taught specifically by Jesus about this and many other doctrines. Go one chapter later, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul goes on to write, he says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And so there again, Paul mentions all four elements. He mentions the bread and the wine and the body and the blood, talking about them as if we all know that they are all participants in what's going on here. And saying even very specifically that if you receive this without discerning the body of Christ, without recognizing that this is the body of Christ, then you're taking it incorrectly. We'll talk more about that in the next lesson. But for now, to address some common questions, like, well, how is that possible? Like his real body? Like his actual body, it's not like Jesus took like an exacto knife and, you know, took out a chunk of his flesh and said, here is my body to the disciples. He took a piece of bread that was not at all connected with his body, but he said, he said, this is my body. And with the wine, he said, this is my blood. How is that possible? You wouldn't be the first person to ask that question of God. Remember that Jesus' earthly mother did as well. When the angel came to Mary and said, Mary, though you're a virgin, Though you've never been intimate with any man, you are going to conceive. There's going to be a child in your womb. And Mary asked the question, well, <laughs> how can this happen? How is this possible? Since, I've, since I'm a virgin, since I've never been with a man. And do you remember the angel's answer? In Luke chapter 1, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. No word from God will ever fail. If God says it, it will happen. God is the only one who needs to understand how something is going to happen. We don't need to understand how. We just need to know what he promises and what he says. In addition, if I were to ask you where Jesus is right now, you could say any number of things. You could say Jesus is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. You could say Jesus is living in our hearts because that's what the Bible says. You could say Jesus is everywhere. He's with us always. You could also say Jesus is in, with, and under the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper, that Jesus himself really is there. How? God knows how. We don't need to know how. And the second question, well, why? Why would Jesus do this? Why would he give his disciples his real body and his real blood? Well, remember the context, that this is the night before Jesus was going to die. And often before someone dies, knowing they're going to die, they leave a last will and testament. You know, something they are going to leave behind for the people they love. And that, in a sense, is what Jesus was doing with this meal, with his last meal that he would have with his disciples. He was giving them his last will and testament and what he was leaving behind for his friends was himself. Saying, see, my friends, I'm giving you myself, like my real self. 
And it is the same thing that Jesus gives to you every time you receive the Lord's Supper. He's giving you himself, his real actual body, his real actually actual blood that was shed for you, and giving you those things in a way that he is so close that you can, you can feel him, that you can, your senses perceive him, that the blood, it, it warms your throat as it goes down to your, as it goes down into you. And where Jesus himself is becoming so close to you that he cannot easily be separated from you. Jesus is engaging our senses with this wonderful gift that he gives us, church. Just reminding us that he is close to us, that he is with us and allowing us to feel it and perceive it in a way that we normally can't and we normally don't. But of course, that's not the only blessing that we get when we receive the Lord's Supper. Remember what Jesus said. He said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for, do you remember? The forgiveness of sins. For the forgiveness of sins. And just think about why that would be so significant for those who were sitting around the table with him that evening. Jesus was sitting around a table with sinners and people who are either well aware of their sins or would be very shortly. You know, there was, I mean, Judas. Judas was going to sin and he had been sinning against him. He was going to betray him. There was Peter later that night who was going to deny him three times and so he was, he was a liar. He made big promises, big bold promises, but but there was nothing behind him. Remember what Matthew was? Before Matthew became a disciple, he was a tax collector. They didn't have the greatest reputation. They were known for cheating. All the disciples, you could go around the table, every one of them, if you were to ask them, what's, what's the worst part of your heart? They would have had an answer. And Jesus, knowing how easy it is for all of us to remember the reasons we have to feel guilty, he was giving his disciples the solution to that pain right there in that meal. Either for the, for the pains that already existed or he was giving them something that the disciples would be able to hold on to after those new pains would be created that evening or that weekend. Here, this is for the forgiveness of every sin. The forgiveness of every sin. Just remember the significance of what took place on the cross. Remember in Isaiah when it says that the punishment that brings us peace was upon him. Remember that Jesus was being punished for our sins. In a sense, he was calling himself the selfish, lying, betraying, materialistic disciple. He was saying, Father, blame me for those sins and let everyone else go free. Let everyone else be forgiven. Jesus in this, he was connecting them with the, with the cost of our salvation. The body that was offered for us, the blood that was shed for us, with bread, with wine, with his body, with his blood. And so there you have, you know, the ways that Holy Communion is similar to baptism, you know, both started by Jesus. Jesus is the one who told his disciples, go and baptize, do this often with communion now. It offers forgiveness of sins, new life and salvation, and of course, it connects God's word, God's promises with something visible, tangible. In baptism, it's the water. In Holy Communion, it's the bread and the wine. And, and somebody might ask, well, well, why is this necessary? Like, why are the extra ways of obtaining forgiveness necessary? Can't we just tell people the gospel, tell people the good news that Jesus died for their sins and, and tell people that they're forgiven? Why would Jesus go to all the trouble of establishing this new thing of baptism and this new thing of Holy Communion? And why would we have to take the time to learn about all of these things? That's a good question. And I think there's a really good answer. You know, just, just like a husband can tell his wife that he loves her just once and then never buy her flowers or get her candy or take her out on dates or buy her jewelry and hold her hand. And, and maybe he could rightly expect her to remember that he loves her <laughs> forever. No good husband will do that. A good husband will tell his wife that he loves her 
and then tell her again and again and again. And also, he will buy her flowers occasionally and get her candy and take her out on dates and, and buy her jewelry and, and hold her hand. And he will be generous in his expressions of love, looking to express his love in any number of ways so that it never becomes just an old thing. A good husband is generous with his love, and just like a good husband is generous in his expressions of love towards his wife, God is generous in how he assures us that we are forgiven. He gives us many ways to do that because he never wants it to become old for us. And how cool that, that God connects the, the declarations of forgiveness with things that we do every day already. I mean, washing and bathing and, and cleaning ourselves, for, you know, connecting it with baptism. Every time we wash our hands, we can be reminded that, oh, God washed my heart clean in baptism. With eating and, and drinking and gathering together with other friends, like, I mean, that's, that can remind us of communion. Every time we sit down for a meal and, and we thank God for the food, we're just like, oh, Jesus once sat down with his disciples and he gave them forgiveness and a very special meal. And he did it all for you. Jesus pointed that out. You know, drink from it. All of you, he said to his disciples. Jesus was thinking of you when he made this. Jesus was thinking of your need to hear that you are forgiven. He was thinking about the times in life when you feel far from God. And he didn't want you to feel that way any longer. So he created this meal where God himself, God himself comes close to us in a way that we can sense, in a way that we can feel while holding on to his wonderful promises of what God does for us in this very special meal. How you can receive this gift to its fullest, to receive all of its greatest blessings. That's what we'll talk about next time.